now 8.52 a.m. We have quorum to start, so we will. Today in our, um, on Bonjour tout le monde, um, j'espère. Hello everyone, I hope you're doing well. Today we have two items on our agenda. La 16e réunion du sous but first things first, Bien, uh, welcome to meeting number 16 of the Subcommittee on International Human Rights. Today's meeting is taking place in a hybrid format. Of uh, le 23 juin 2020. Pursuant to the House Order of June 23, 2022, members can attend in person in the room and remotely using the Zoom application. Uh, proper order of this meeting, we're asking, not asking, but all members must uh, be recognized before speaking. Whenever speaking, please speak clearly into the mic. Interpretation is available on Zoom. And just a reminder that all comments should be directed to the chair. I would like to welcome uh, a new member, um, Ziad Abu Abulatayev. Uh, from Edmonton Manning. At the top, not uh, premier uh, tâche va être pour uh, nommer. Her first task will be to uh, elect our first vice chair. To our study with, uh, with Tigre. Um, and I'd like to thank uh, Mr. Cooper for his services committee. Now, without further ado, Uh, we're going to we're going to open up the floor to nominations uh, for our vice chair. Do you have any nominations? Yes, Mr. Abdulatayev. Thank you, uh, uh, chair, for uh, welcoming me this morning and happy to work with uh, our colleagues here on the important committee. Um, I'd like to nominate uh, MP uh, Virsen for uh, the position of vice chair. Thank you for that nomination. And that's pursuant to standing order 1062. Uh, the first vice chair must be a member. Do, do I read this in now or after you this? You, you want me to read it in? MP Versen has been moved. Any other motion? Thank you for that. Uh, MP Versen has been uh, moved as uh, vice, uh, um, vice chair. Is there any other motion for any other vice chairs? W without any other further motions, it's acclaimed. Uh, Mr. Versen, congratulations. You're our vice chair. Thank you very much. So now, without any further ado, it's 8:55. Um, we have till uh, 45 after uh, 10. Exactly. Thank you, Mr. Vice Chair. Uh, 45 after 10. Um, so we'll use that time to go through. We'll divide into two, and we'll have our two panels. And, and uh, our witnesses are online. Correct. Great. Just one second, please. Perfect. Thank you. <laughs> so now we're entering into um, the study on Tigre, which is uh, continued from our um, our previous meeting, we've already had one meeting on this where we had uh, a number of committee members uh, give impromptu testimony to us uh, at a committee that worked, uh, a meeting I should say, that worked really well. Um, we now have this meeting and the next one to study Tigre after which we'll be writing a report. Now entering into that, the current situation Tigre pursuant to setting order 1082 and the motion adopted by this subcommittee on Thursday, April 26, 2022 and on Friday, September 23rd, 2022. Our subcommittee will resume the study on Tigre. Um, it's a pleasure to welcome uh, Gautamin Gebruyelel. My apologies on the pronunciation of your name. Please do pronounce it properly for us. Um, a postdoctoral fellow at Yale, and Ian Spears, Associate Professor of 
Political Science, University of Guelph. Uh, you each have a maximum of five minutes, and uh, I'll keep timing. I ask you to keep timing also. Five minutes for your opening remarks, after which we'll enter into uh, rounds of questions and answers. Please, Mr. Gabriel Duhel. My apologies again. Please pronounce it for us correctly so we know how to pronounce your family name. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, my name is Goitom Gabriel Duhel, so it was uh, close enough. Um, I'd like to thank the committee for inviting me to give this uh, presentation. I will focus my presentation on why the atrocities in Tigray show very strong indications of genocidal intent. Um, I'll start by noting that the stated objective of the Ethiopian government when they launched the war uh, in November 2020 uh, was to apprehend uh, the leaders of the Tigray People's uh, Liberation Front. Uh, what in fact ensued uh, was, however, a systematic uh, uh, set of atrocities committed on uh, the civilian population of Tigray. Um, many atrocities were committed. I'll go through some of the uh, most severe ones. Uh, the first one is ethnic cleansing. Um, the moment uh, troops from the federal uh, government of Ethiopia, the Amhara Regional State and Eritrea, entered Western and Southern Tigray in November 2020. They proceeded to ethnically cleanse uh, 1.2 million Tigrayans from these areas. Uh, the remaining Tigrayans were throughout 2021 subjected to uh, killings and torture. Uh, some of the most disturbing accounts include um, corpses of Tigrayans whose hands were tied behind their backs and their eyes gouged out uh, that were floating down the river um, to Sudan in high numbers. Um, a recent report by Human Rights Watch and Amnesty International concluded that these atrocities uh, constituted crimes against humanity. The other atrocity that has characterized this uh, war is the systemic uh, sexual and gender-based violence uh, and the use of it as a weapon of war. Prime Minister Abiy Ahmed unleashed a wave of systemic rape on Tigrayan women and girls. Uh, after entering Tigray. USAID estimated in uh, 2021 that uh, 22,500 uh, women and girls would need treatment uh, from these uh, uh, violations, whereas a study from the Tigray Bureau of Health uh, estimated these numbers to be around 120,000 uh, women. Um, uh, the victims of these uh, atrocities or, or crimes also reported that uh, in addition to being subjected to rape, uh, the perpetrators would often subject them to other forms of physical violence, such as inserting nails into their bodies. Um, the ethnic motives behind these uh, 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 crimes were also made manifest by the statements that these perpetrators made uh, during these actions. So some of the things that uh, the victims report is that they told them, and I quote, that they were Amharizing them, cleansing them, cleansing them of their Tigrayan blood, and that a Tigrayan womb should not give birth. Uh, I think this uh, provides indication that the rape, uh, 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 the purpose of the rape was to destroy the reproductive capacities of Tigrayan women, and thus constitutes uh, a genocidal uh, intention. Um, the third atrocity I would want to uh, draw attention to is the use of mass starvation as a weapon of war. Uh, the Ethiopian government engineered a large-scale famine in Tigray. Um, this began during their occupation of Tigray between November 2020 and um, uh, June 2021, uh, where they systematically destroyed water pumps, crops, food storages, they looted the civilian population, as well as blocked those in need of getting access to humanitarian assistance. Since uh, they were pushed out of central and southern Tigray in June 2021, uh, all of Tigray has been under a total siege where no medication, uh, very little food aid, uh, uh, and no basic services are allowed into Tigray. Uh, the humanitarian, the former UN humanitarian chief, Mark Lowcock, has confirmed that starvation is being used as a weapon of war um, by the uh, uh, Ethiopian government. And he also stated that uh, 
the Ethiopian government managed to block um, a declaration of famine in the UN uh, in 2021. Um, I think you know, one important aspect of this war that has uh, been neglected is uh, uh, the hate speech and what that tells us about the war. So um, atroc these atrocities were essentially preceded by two and a half years or three years of uh, collective demonization of Tigrayans uh, by the state media and uh, the current leaders of Ethiopia. Prior to and during the war, pub pub public calls for the extermination of Tigrayans by government officials and associated public figures uh, were rampant in reference to Tigrayans uh, statements such as uh, and I quote, each of us should kill one to grant and die. We are 30 million. There are 6 million. If we sacrifice 6 million, the rest can be liberated. End of quote. Another statement uh, that we've seen is to grants are not of the human race. The devil is better than them. Um, these statements or statements such as these have been rampant and they've been made uh, uh, regularly on public TV and, uh, uh, and state media. Uh, which I think uh, is, you know, illustrates the motivations uh, behind, uh, behind the war. A recent report by the UN Human Rights Council also echoed these claims. They found that hate speech and acts of violence in Ethiopia uh, seem to, and I quote, go beyond the mere intent to kill and instead reflect a desire to destroy, end of quote. Uh, they also conclude that Ethiopian government has, uh, quote, implemented a widespread range of measures designed to systematically deprive the population of Tigray of material services, material and services indispensable for its survival, end of quote. And this is, I think, very close to the uh, uh, definition of genocide we find in the, in the uh, Genocide Convention, Article 2C, uh, which stipulates that uh, deliberate inf deliberately inflicting on the group conditions of life calculated to bring about its physical destruction in whole or in part constitutes an act of genocide. Thank you, um, Mr. Uh, Gabriel. Um, we have uh, used up your time and we'll continue to our next witness, Mr. Spears, Professor Spears. Um, sorry, Mr. Uh, Dr. Spears. Uh, that's no trouble. Uh, thank you very much for this opportunity to speak to you about the current crisis in the Tigray region of Ethiopia, because in recent days, the situation in Ethiopia may have reached a turning point as Tigray becomes subject to an assault from two, possibly three armies. Uh, one, the Ethiopian National Defense Force, or ENDF. The second, the Eritrean Defense Force, or EDF. And three, Amhara Special Forces. For the government in Addis Ababa, the TPLF represents a threat for the following reasons. One, the TPLF are former rulers who believe that they are uniquely qualified for that role. Two, the TPLF have, ex have exercised power in Ethiopia for significant stretches of Ethiopia's history, and especially from 1991 to 2018. And three, the TPLF have repeatedly demonstrated a capacity to wield power, military power, and to defeat other claimants to power. The view uh, of the Addis Ababa regime and its allies is that if the TPLF are not eliminated once and for all, they will rise up again. The Eritreans under President Isaias Afewerki have a grudge of their own with Tigray. Eritreans and Tigrayans have been allies at times and indeed collaborated in the past to defeat the Marxist regime of Mengistu Haile Miriam in 1991. As leaders of their respective independent uh, states, however, they have once again become rivals and have fought a bruising border war from 1998 to 2000. While the Eritreans were defeated in 2000, they have not forgotten these events and seek to take back territory they regard as their own. There are also suspicions that uh, Eritrean President Isaias has his own designs on Ethiopia. In any event, the government in Asmara effectively has a veto over any agreement between the TPLF and the government in Addis Ababa. That is a problem. Amharas too have been willing accomplices in the effort to destroy the TPLF. 
Amharas have historically been among uh, Ethiop the Ethiopian ruling class, and many were delighted at the at the displacement of the TPLF from Asmara, fr pardon me, from Addis Ababa in 2018. The Amharas were territorial losers in the 1990s when the TPLF reorganized the country according to ethnic or national identity. And since the commencement of the war in November 2020, Amhara have sought to reoccupy this lost territory and ethnically cleanse Western Tigray. Uh, the TPLF itself, while apparently victims of this current crisis, is not blameless. For many Ethiopians, Tigrayan arrogance and the privileging of its own interests after the fall of the communist regime in 1991 is a source of resentment. But the TPLF are also survivors whose capacity to endure hardship in the context of war should not be underestimated. Again, this is a challenge. The TPLF's defeat of the regime in of Mengisto Haile Miriam, as I say, in May 1991, was the culmination of a 15-year struggle or longer that came at enormous cost. The insurgents, the insurgents, as they were at that time, prevailed because of its singular vision and extraordinary organizational capacity. The TPLF then restructured Ethiopia according to a form of ethnic federalism that did address many, or at least some, of the nationalities' questions in Ethiopia, but also generated new tensions. Because of its minority status, Tigrans, which formed the TPLF uh, um, and also formed the core of another group called the EPRDF, the Ethiopian P People's Revolutionary Democratic Front, for three decades, has been extremely sensitive to changes in the local distribution of power amongst its rivals. Only in 2018 did the Amhara and Oromo coalition partners succeed in what some have described as an end run that allowed a non-Tigrayan newcomer, Abiy Ahmed, President Abiy Ahmed, to assume, pardon me, Prime Minister Abiy Ahmed, to assume the Prime Minister's office. So Ethiopia now finds itself locked in a struggle amongst powerful and very disciplined groups, especially the Eritreans and especially the TPLF. The objective of the belligerents, you should be aware, is not peace, but is security. Virtually every action, every act of aggression, every act of intransigence, and every act of peace should be seen in this context. Even the peace between Ethiopian Pre Prime Minister Abiy Ahmed and Eritrean President Isaias that led to the Nobel Peace Prize should be seen as a strategic move to isolate the Tigrayans rather than an acknowledgement of the benefits of peace. While the Ethiopian government may respond favorably to political and economic pressure for a humanitarian solution, they are likely to resist any effort that obstructs its ability to destroy the TPLF as a military force. In humanitarian terms, the results will be disastrous. Thank, Thank you, you um, Mr. Dr. Spears. Um, we, we have reused up your time. We'll move into questions and answers, um, starting with um, MP Versen for seven minutes. Well, thank you, uh, Mr. Chair. I, uh, I, I was kind of uh, more understanding that we were having a third witness. Is uh, are they coming later, or they have made it? We are we are having two more witnesses and a second panel. Uh, but for, okay, <clears throat> so please go ahead. Very good. Um, you know, thank you very much for your presentations uh, to our guests this morning. Um, just going. Uh, Mr. or Dr. Spears, um, we're just wondering about uh, this committee is de generally dedicated to the human rights abuses. Um, do you think that there is a, a way to separate the human rights abuses from the political situation? Um, that's that because this is a fundamentally a political struggle uh, that's happening in Ethiopia. Um, how, how do we how do should we separate the humanitarian issues uh, from 
from the political issue? And is that even possible? Um, I think that's a, that's a terrific question. I'm not sure that it is possible. Um, each group, uh, I mean, this is a, an issue that we deal with in, in any kind of um, ethnic or national conflict is that the groups will often see themselves, uh, the belligerents will see themselves as representatives of their respective peoples. And particularly in the case of the TPLF, but also with, um, uh, with the Amhara group, is uh, they see themselves as defending and as especially, again, I'll say as the TPLF, as being of the people. Um, the the uh, TPLF uh, and its leadership during the war against the Derg in the 1980s uh, and early 1990s uh, never left the country. They were among their own people. Um, and so that association is is uh, is very tight. I think you're going to have to be addressing, um, at least to some extent, both of those issues. You're going to have to be solving um, the you know, managing the the belligerents themselves, the ones who are doing the fighting, because they see themselves as defending their people. Uh, Mr. Goldson, do you want to uh, perhaps take a crack at that question as well? Uh, just is it is it going to be possible to separate the humanitarian from the political issues that we're seeing in, in Tigray? I think it's important to note here that uh, you know the the war from the outset, in my view, was waged directly at the civilian population of Tigray. If you look at the atrocities that are happening, they have very little, in my view, political or military logics. You know, what is the military purpose of mass rape? Uh, what is the uh, uh, you know military purpose of uh, uh, the hate speech that we hear on a daily basis, talking of exterminating uh, civilians? What is the uh, uh, um, you know political purpose uh, of of the use of mass starvation as a weapon of war if it's not to harm the civilian population? So uh, you know these things are you know attacking civilians has been at the core in my view of the government's strategy so um it is it is the the, the political the core political purpose it's very difficult to uh, disentangle these and uh i would also draw attention to the fact that uh, sexual and gender based violence is not something we see in every in every war these things are not natural phenomena how many governments today are using mass starvation as a weapon of war against their own citizens how often does ethnic cleansing happen there are multiple conflicts around the world ethnic cleansing of one million people these things are quite rare and i i, I really want to draw attention to the dangers of normalizing them as you know simply part of uh, conflict and and simply part of uh, war uh, these are extraordinary uh, human rights abuses today and i i would you know dare anyone to name uh two or three conflicts today that, you know, where we see uh, attacks on civilians on this scale. So I think a, a big problem uh, in the way we've been approaching the war is to normalize and minimize, uh, you know, uh, the, the acts of, of, of the Ethiopian government. Thank you. Uh, um, Mr. Spears, just uh, as this committee is gonna go forward, we're gonna make recommendations to the Canadian government uh, as to uh, the Canadian government action. Um, it feels like to me we we play a role of of, of referee. Um, we can we can make statements around you know, condemning condemning bad action, um, but that we also have an opportunity perhaps on um, building building democracy, building institutions, uh, helping them do that in that country. Do you have any recommendations around those two areas um, of how do we play a referee and how do we how do we build a stronger democracy in? And, uh, and should should we spend time on the democracy side? I, I suppose, Mr. Spears. This this is a very good question again, uh, and it is not clear to me that there is an, there is an obvious solution. And I I'm reluctant to to put it in those terms. Um, there have been uh, since the post Derg era. The Derg was the Marxist regime that was overthrown in May 1991. Since that time, there was some progress, but governments 
and their regional leaders are, as I say, extremely sensitive and defensive of their respective populations. And they are very reluctant to concede anything that will allow them to be dominated by somebody else. And so um, what I am concerned about is that in order to, well, the groups are so intransigent, so disciplined, and so powerful, and so reluctant to concede um, anything to the other, that it is it is going to be difficult, or at least the groups will not see it as possible to have a democracy as we see it, perhaps in Canada or the West, uh, without defeating their adversaries. It's just, it's not going to happen. Um, and uh, other people may disagree. I think my views tend to be a little more, uh, as the expression is, real politic, but I think that is the reality. I, I would I would add virtually every organization uh, that writes on these issues will say things like we need inclusive dialogue and um, and and negotiations without preconditions. And it is difficult to disagree with that. But it is easier said than done. And especially in this case where each group is so uh, formidable. Uh, just, and the, my other, the first question was, how, how do you think Canada could play a like a referee role in this? Um, I'll we'll have to take that question up uh, okay. in another round from another um, another one of our members. Uh, next, we'll move on to uh, Mr. Asasi for seven minutes, please. Uh, thank you, uh, Mr. Chair. Uh, allow me to thank both witnesses for their uh, powerful yet uh, harrowing testimony. Um, so if I could uh, first start off uh, with Mr. Spears. Uh, Mr. Spears, could you uh, explain to us how uh, international uh, humanitarian mechanisms uh, have been able to deal uh, with all of the challenges on the ground? I'm not sure I'm the best person to, to answer this question because I don't think that I don't think they've been able to deal with this. The uh, 25 years ago, I uh, met with um, one of your colleagues, John Bosley, uh, in Addis Ababa, and he said to me that it is it, it there is very little that Canada can do. Maybe I can answer both of these questions. There's little that Canada can do because the, the belligerents themselves. Uh, Mr. Are... Mr. Spears, I'm asking about international humanitarian efforts, not uh, Canada's role. Well, uh, well, I mean, the, <laughs> for humanitarian efforts, then, then you have to be finding a way to provide, to to be in, to be getting the parties on the ground to allow humanitarian efforts into the country. And right now, the the government uh, in Addis Ababa is blocking that, and so, uh, and and of course, they are a sovereign state. So uh, and they've been quite effective in in uh, in blocking any access, especially when there is when they are, um, as has been stated uh, quite clearly and quite powerfully, when when there are atrocities being committed. So they are not. Uh, so, so the I mean, the, the only thing that I think can be done is to be I mean, Ethiopia is uniquely situated, I suppose, because it has been an ally of the West, especially the United States. And so there is the capacity to to lean on them uh, and effectively coerce them into allowing humanitarian uh, um, uh, organizations to enter the country. That is really um, the only thing. And then just leaving it to them to provide uh, those services. And with the exception of the U.S., which, as you explained, uh, has an alliance with the Ethiopian government, uh, it seems, uh, what can other members of the international community do to ensure that uh, humanitarian assistance isn't being impeded, it's not being stymied? What kind of pressure can other members of the international uh, community subject uh, the government to? whatever resources they have at their disposal. I mean, it, I, the, the, the problem is, is that really the only levers we have are things like aid, but aid is exactly what is needed. And so uh, 
it, it's it's not clear. Um, you know, of course, there's things like diplomatic recognition, but they will they will see the Tigrayans not as they don't see themselves. Of course, the government does not see themselves as the bad guys. In fact, it was just a couple of years ago that that uh, Abiy Ahmed won the Nobel Prize and was literally Ethiopia's celebrity politician. Um, and they, as I said in my remarks, uh, they see the TPLF, rightly or wrongly, as an existential threat. So uh, they will withstand, I think, a fair bit of pressure before they relent. But, you know, there have been indications on both sides that when that when the pressure is significant, then they they offer, I suppose, some concessions, but it never seems to be enough, and I don't think that they will allow it to get in the way of um, uh, of defeating their what they regard as their adversary. Thank you, Mr. Spears. Uh, now, if I could go to uh, Mr. Uh, Gubriel, um, I have spoken to members of uh, the Tigrayan community in Canada, and one of the things that has been very, very frustrating is that they are uh, unable and incapable of uh, sending assistance to their loved ones and, and relatives uh, back home. Uh, is there anything that can be done on that particular uh, front to make sure that uh, if there's financial assistance that members of the community want to send back home or um, uh, items that they want to send, is there a solution to this? Because it's, uh, it's, it's really difficult to, to speak to members of the Tigrayan community who are rightfully uh, concerned uh, and have no way of assisting. Thank you uh, for that uh, wonderful question. Um, I think it's important to recognize that this is a siege that's an outcome of policy. This is strategy. So we have, for example, famine in Ethiopia now because Tigrayans cannot access their bank accounts. So you have people that have a lot of money in the bank account, but they can't access it, so they're starving to death. So. Um, this isn't a technical problem and there isn't a technical solution to it. This is a deliberate calculated strategy to starve people to death. Um, so really we have to look at uh, the broader political uh, level. Um, and I would uh, actually uh, uh, you know, point out to your earlier question that there is a great deal the international community can do. Um, the point is that the international community has really done nothing you know, practically nothing. Um, we're not even condemning these atrocities in strong terms. We're basically, you know, not even talking about it. How many governments in the West today are in explicit terms talking about the use of mass starvation as a weapon of war by the Ethiopian government? How many are condemning them in the way they condemn Russia's invasion of Ukraine? So even at the discursive level, uh, uh, you know, we're not even willing to, uh, we're, we're not willing to talk about it. If you look at the media, they go out of their way to, you know, obscure the intentional nature of um, the famine that it is, it's been, uh, you know, essentially engineered. Um, so I think there's a great deal we, we can do. The first thing is to accurately describe what's going on and then, uh, you know, make you know, condemn it and, and, and make very concrete demands of the Ethiopian government. Secondly, the Ethiopian government is economically extremely fragile. Um, they are, uh, you know, the national debt has, has doubled uh, the last uh, four years. Um, there's a big forex crunch. Uh, uh, so there is a great deal, uh, certainly, uh, you know, a great deal of leverage that the U.S. has, but also other uh, Western countries. Uh, what's really lacking is, is, is the political will, which is more or less non-existent. So it's not like a, a real attempt has been made and failed. Uh, the problem is that no attempt has been made. I'll stop there. Thank you. Thank you, Thank Mr. You, Mr. Gruber. Gabriel, Gabriel, Gabriel um, for that. Um, and we're going to continue to our next witness, uh, Mr or our next questioner, I should say, um, Mr. Uh, Brunel Doucet, s'il vous plaît. Merci, Monsieur. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you to our witnesses for being with us for this very important study. This, this study brings us together um, thanks to a motion from Bloc Québécois, and now we have this study. I am in direct contact with members of the Tigray community. I am talking to them almost every week, and I was listening to you, Mr. Gabriel Lowell. 
when you were talking, you're saying that the biggest frustration of the community is that you're, they are not seeing Western governments who are positioning themselves and naming the problem and referring to genocide when it comes to Tigray. You are here today with us, Mr. Gabriel Royal. I would like to give you the opportunity. Um, if you look at the 1948 Convention on Genocide, how could we assess the situation in Tigray as being a genocide situation? Thank you for that uh, uh, very excellent question. Um, I think you know genocide is a is a uh, um, uh, a crime of intent, and I think we have two very strong indicators of intent here. Uh, the first one is at a discursive level. Um, the government itself has not been shy or shy about uh, expressing its intent. Um, Regularly, they've called, uh, uh, they've used dehumanizing language to refer to the Tigran people. Uh, that shows that their target is not the TPLF, but the population at large. And we have several instances where um, talk of exterminating the Tigran people has been expressly uh, communicated via mass media, by either by officials or people, uh, uh, you know, allies of, of, of the government. Uh, we have also a statement by the uh, um, uh, Finnish foreign minister uh, and an EU envoy to the Horn of Africa in Ethiopia, who in his meetings with Ethiopian officials a year ago uh, stated that they told him that they were going to wipe out the Tigrayans. So on a number of occasions, the government itself has made its intention to exterminate or destroy Tigray, very clear. Secondly, we have uh, behavioral indicators that show this intent. Uh, uh, you know, we have the use of mass starvation as a weapon of war. Um, and I think it's, uh, you know, really, um, we have very strong evidence that this is deliberate and intentional and systematic. At, at this point, there is no sort of controversy around that. So if anyone thinks that this is not uh, indicative of an, of, a, of an intent to uh, kill uh, parts or, or all of Tigray. Uh, I mean, I would be interested in hearing the logic of the argument that, you know, what is the motivation behind putting an entire population under siege and denying them access to food, destroying uh, their crops, uh, and then essentially engineering famine if it's not to kill all of them? Right? What happens? What is the logical sort of sequence of, of outcomes when one does that? Of course, it is the mass murder or entire extermination of an entire population. So uh, we have a number of behavioral indicators uh, uh, showing that uh, uh, they're taking systemic actions in order to destroy uh, uh, the Tigran people. And recently, the uh, UN report by or the report by the uh, UN Human Rights Council also states uh, uh, this um, this intent, and I can. You know. uh, Mr. Spe Mr. Spears, you published different articles on the leadership and the limits of government intervention in Africa, and you talk about the efforts of the international community when it comes to. Uh, establishing peace. This is an article from 2007 I'm referring to, so you're an expert on this. So what's your opinion when it comes to the leadership displayed by international community, Tigrayan international community? And as a follow-up question, um, I will also come to the leadership that Canada has been able to display when it comes to Tigray compared to other events happening on the international level. I'm, I'm just wondering if you could clarify the question. Are you asking about the leader, the the leadership of the of the Tigrayans in the international community? Is no, 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 no. Uh, I was reading your article published in 2007. It talks about leadership and limits of government intervention in Africa. So, international community at the government intervention level in Africa. That's what I'm interested in. Um, so what's your I, opinion about the international leadership, the international community's leadership? 
Well, I, I guess my problem is is that uh, there are limitations on what can be done. Um, I'm not sure if it's a quite you know. I suppose the leadership is 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 disappointing. I'm just I'm my, the problem I always have is I hear people saying uh, that there is a lack of political will. I'm not always clear on specifically what the international community thinks should be done. The the problem that Africa faces, the problem that Ethiopia faces, and that is. Uh, that it occurs all across Africa is that you have state borders that are drawn by outsiders. And that is the challenge that African rulers must contend with from independence forward. So I suppose there is a lack of leadership, but I'm always wanting to know specifically, what are you talking about that should be done? It's not, you know, I, I, uh, I, I don't. I don't think that that Ethiop, Ethiopia is necessarily being ignored. I think that the fact that we're having this discussion today shows that Canada is 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 showing some leadership. And this has been obviously. I know you've had uh, meetings prior to today on this on this issue. the The challenge is that this is going to be a forever problem because. There is not a coherent regime. There are multiple political traditions across Africa contained within one state. And Ethiopia is just among the most profound demonstrations of that problem. You have several groups that regard themselves as, as, need, as, as entitled to rule and as wanting to assume power uh, in order to protect themselves, not because they're power hungry, but because they regard that as central to their rule. So central to their group's protection. So there are limitations on what the international community can do, Thank whether you. or not they want to demonstrate leadership. Thank you, uh, Dr. Spears. We're going to continue with our next uh, questioner, um, Ms. McPherson. Thank you, Mr. Chair. And I would like to thank our, our witnesses for being with us today. This is... Um, you know, of course, your testimony is incredibly difficult to hear uh, and, and you know, is making me feel like there, there needs to be more that we can do. And, I, and it is, it is um, hard to hear that, 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 that it is – those solutions are, are particularly hard to come by. I do, I do worry. Um, you know, I'm grateful that we are taking on this study right now. I, I, you know, this is something that's been happening since November 2020. I think it is something that we should have been studying sooner, uh, much, uh, much sooner. Um, I know we had tried to, to do this in the last, in the last uh, session. Um, and, and, I, and I do, I do wonder if it is the complexity of this issue that is causing the world to turn away or why it is that the world is turning away. I mean, obviously, we we see the global community um, focusing quite a bit on what is happening in Ukraine, what has happened in Afghanistan. There are many hot spots around the world that are that are requiring our attention. But but this particular um, this particular conflict is it, the loss of life, the the clear genocidal um, acts that are taking place, the attacks on civilians, the attacks on schools, on hospitals. It, it does. It does um, alarm me that we are not seeing the the international community raise this more more actively. And and from what I'm what I'm hearing from the testimony and the questions that have, we've heard, that the, the there needs to be a solution regardless of the fact that there is some very very deep um, potentially unsolvable problems. There does need to be some sort of a ceasefire, some sort of way to get humanitarian <coughs> aid in. Um, and some sort of way to come up with a, a resolution of some sort. Um, so I, I guess I'll start with you, with you, Mr. Uh, Gabriel. Um, and I'll, I'll ask both of you the same question, but, but there, what is, I mean, ultimately, what is the role for Canada? What is the role for multilateral institutions, humanitarian institutions, the United Nations, uh, the African Union, um, you know, what is the role for for those, and how does Canada play a bigger role in in influencing those multilateral institutions? I mean, 
Ultimately, what's happening on the ground is, is, is horrific, and Canada must, as a, as a, as a huge contributor to, to Ethiopia, we must be able to have some sort of influence for a solution. So if I, if I could start with you, Mr. Gabriel. And I, I know I probably pronounced that incorrectly. I apologize. Thank you. Uh, thank you for a fantastic question, and pronunciation was, was fine. Um, I think, you know, I'll go back to the same to the same argument that I was making earlier, uh, um, you know, an easy uh, initiative that comes at a very low cost for any global actor today is really to uh, put Tigray on the agenda and to, you know, clearly state what, what's going on because there's been a systematic, uh, um, you know, attempt by media, civil society actors, diplomats to really obscure what's going on in Tigray. And it's really interesting that it's taken two years to have this conversation globally. And it's important to ask what was going on the, the past two years. Uh, the past two years, uh, we've seen uh, the international community really try to bury this story. Uh, and uh, you know, many indicators one can point to um, regurgitating the government's uh, views on things. There's been a, a, a very sort of clear uh, interest in not upsetting the Ethiopian government. And I think it's important to move uh, from that. It, it's important to have uh, one's priorities uh, clear. Um, and uh, so I think simply in terms of putting this on the agenda uh, will have a ripple effect on other uh, Western countries and other governments uh, to follow uh, this lead, uh, particularly partnering up with the U.S. I think there is, I think the U.S. is, is, is you know, divided 50-50 on this issue and really push from the outside to take a, a harsher stance on, on Ethiopia uh, could have a big impact. Um, secondly, I think it's uh, important uh, to point out uh, those countries that are, are fueling this conflict. Uh, we've seen massive amounts of weapons being flown to Ethiopia from countries like UAE, Iran, uh, Turkey. Many of these are uh, US and, 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 and allies of Canada. So, uh, you know, putting pressure on them, exposing their actions and their role in this can be very important. And finally, I think it's important to distinguish the complex political issues from uh, the mass atrocities. You know, uh, it's fine that we have political conflict. It's it, it is one thing that we can't agree on uh, democracy. That certain groups uh, want to rule, or 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 you know, we have flawed elections. It's another thing that we're using mass starvation as a weapon of war. So I think it's important to focus on those core elements, uh, regardless of what happens politically no one should be using starvation as a weapon of war. No one should be engaging in ethnic cleansing and we shouldn't be putting civilians in their tens of thousands in ethnic concentration camps. So I think, you know, really focusing on these narrow core human rights issues is, is, is what's uh, needed in the, in the immediate term. And the, and the political questions can, I think can be engaged with through different means over the long term, but immediately this this is what I think should be prioritized. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, if I could ask uh, Dr. Spears for his thoughts. I know we don't have very much time left. <laughs> well, the obvious things are, you know, the obvious things are if you're if you're wanting to if if Canada needs to be as even handed as possible, which I assume they do is offer venues for negotiation or support negotiations and encourage negotiations. Um, Second is apply uh, economic pressure on the government um, to the extent, as I say, that that's possible. Being aware that there are problems and challenges associated with that uh, too. Uh, I would be very concerned if the government were to collapse. Um, uh, and third, I guess, would be to reward progress. So when, when progress is being made, then that would require Canada to step up and provide incentives for more progress. Thank you. But again, thank sorry. you, Dr. Spears. Um, and we're now going to have uh, a final round. Um, we'll have two minutes from for each and every party, uh, which will likely give you one question and an answer. Um, 
We're going to start off with Mr. Sidhu for two minutes, please. Thank you, uh, Mr. Chair. Um, Dr. Spears, if you'd like to continue to finish your answer. Um, sorry, you got cut off there. Well, my answer is, 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 is again, to raise, <laughs> I feel like I'm not being very helpful when I'm causing more problems than anything else, except to say that you ha at some point, if, if uh, this problem is to be solved, there has to be a decision made about what Canada wants out of this situation. Are you wanting to support the government or are you wanting to support the TPLF? And I understand that that is a decision that, that doesn't, that people don't want to make. Um, but it, in some ways it's going to be unavoidable because uh, both groups um, are powerful. The, the Ethiopian government has huge numbers of troops that it and that it defeated the Eri the Eritreans in 2000 by just throwing more troops at it so they are not going away and neither is the TPLF so managing those two beyond just saying you want to include people uh, um, is going to be difficult thank you thank you mr. chair you have 45 seconds if you want to use it uh, sure, I just want to say, well, I mean, I can't get a question and answer in 45 seconds, but I'll just say thank you to, to both witnesses for your time today. Uh, definitely uh, very insightful, and, and I just want to say thank you again. Thank you, Mr. Sidhu. And we'll continue to our next questioner, uh, Mr. Abu, Abu Tayef. Yeah, thank you. In the lack of time, i just like to, uh, to, know, to say that this is a very, very complicated situation. Uh, it's been there for, for a long time. Uh, just a specific question, what can Canadian government do uh, to influence the Ethiopian government to allow for shipments to get through to the uh, Tigrayan region? Um, I think that's, uh, that has been a problem in the last months, and uh, although through ceasefire there could be a chance that this will be <coughs> flow again, but uh, I think if anything Canada can do probably is to um, influence the government to open up uh, or to allow for shipments. Um, uh, Dr. Spears, do you believe there's a possibility that Canada have the capacity to play this role? Thank you. Well, it's, it, whether it has the capacity, uh, I, I don't know. I, uh, whenever I'm in Ethiopia, I do see Canadian aid shipments, so um, I suppose it is possible. I'm not sure what how much aid Canada does provide, but uh, the, the problem is is that when uh, groups become more amenable to making concessions when they're under military pressure, and that is what's just happened in the last few months, um, and so that is the that is the part that is difficult to disentangle. Governments will be more amenable when they are under pressure. So the government of the, the central government in Addis Ababa was more amenable when the TPLF was 160 kilometers from its border. That is the challenge. That is yet another challenge that, that Canada has to contend with. Question, uh, should Canadian government recognize genocide? In 30 seconds. Is that directed towards me? Yes, or to, yes please. Uh, <laughs> Uh, it is. I think it is probably. I have no doubt that it is happening. Uh, at what point it becomes uh, uh, genocide in the sense that you want to acknowledge it, um, I'm not sure. I'm not sure it would uh, be constructive. It would just, I suspect, further alienate the the government in Addis Ababa. But I have no doubt that uh, that the government sees that as part of its objective. Thank you. Thank you. We're going to continue on to Mr. Uh, Brunel Decep for two minutes, please. Mm. Merci, Monsieur. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I will refer to the study we undertook about the Uyghurs and using the genocide word. We started talking about this file on in media terms. Um, can, but Canada has to assume its responsibilities. Mr. Gabriel Well, we were saying that Canada was doing something. While this study might be proof that we're 
looking into the situation in Tigray, but this is coming from the opposition parties. We haven't heard anything from the Canadian government, from the prime minister or his cabinet, um, from his ministers. We haven't heard anything. Do you think that calling a spade a spade, or calling things as they are, and uh, what's happening against the Tigrayan people and speaking out against the Ethiopian government from the Canadian government, would that have a bigger impact and would it make it easier to intervene if needed in, the, in this file? Thank you for your question. Um, yes, most certainly. I think it's important to notice that we've had two years of this war now. And in these two, in these two years, we've pursued a particular diplomatic approach internationally which is you know, quiet diplomacy, not confront the government, and really a policy of appeasement. And it's important to ask, what has that policy produced? It has produced 600,000 casualties in Tigray and plunged Ethiopia further down uh, into chaos. Uh, so I think at this point, it's fair enough. We have enough evidence to conclude that that diplomatic approach has not succeeded, and there's no reason to think that it will succeed. Um, not calling a spade a spade has only uh, emboldened the Ethiopian government. And they're continuing to make these genocidal statements uh, in public. And I think that's an indication that really they, they have understood that the international community has uh, you know, decided not to confront Ethiopia, uh, regardless of what it does. Uh, and I think that's very dangerous. I think, uh, you know, getting a genocide declaration out in public will really put pressure on other international actors. It will put pressure on uh, those that are fueling the war by providing weapons, Thank countries you. like the UAE, Turkey. Thank you, uh, Mr. Merci, uh, merci, Mr. merci beaucoup. Thank you. Thank you very much. For do Dr. I should say, uh, Gabriel Luel. Um, and finally, uh, to Ms. McPherson for two minutes. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair, and again, thank you to our witnesses. Uh, you know, I'm, I'm going to echo what my colleague from the Bloc has, has said, that that we have we have heard members of, of all parties speak about this, but we have not heard from the government. You know, I have here a list of letter after letter I have written to uh, the Minister of International Development and the Minister of Foreign Affairs and have received zero responses to those letters. Uh, so so I, I'm... I'm I'm shocked that we are not hearing from them, and I would, I will, I will be writing again to urge them for for a response. Um, I did want to take this last little bit of time. I know that we have cut you off, Dr. Spears, um, repeatedly, and I wanted to get give you just the last minute to talk a little bit more about the African Union and the multilateral institutions and the roles that they can play in this conflict, please. In a minute and a half. Well, the African Union is has been involved. The problem is that it is not necessarily seen as a as an impartial uh, um, body. The African Union is based in Addis Ababa, um, as you may or may not know, um, and um, uh, the former Nigerian president Olusegun Obasanjo um, has inserted himself quite actively in this process, but he is uh, seen as too close to the government. So um, to the government of Ethiopia. Um, and so I think there is the African Union is obviously interested in solving this problem. They do not like having attention uh, um, in on one of its member states. Um, but the one of the problems is that it's it's the African Union uh, that is seen as being uh, potentially biased in favor of the government. So it. Uh, you know, if you're asking for about an, a, a role that is non-African, I mean, uh, Af the African Union is often pointed to as a African solutions to African problems, but in this case, that's a that's a troublesome one. Um, so it may be that other states have to get involved. It just the the issue is that finding a body that is agreeable to both sides um, is is itself a challenge. So Canada uh, there could, has been could play that role. Yes, yes, I think so. I and, think so. And we'll leave it at that. Um, thank you uh, to the witnesses for being here uh, in this uh, first panel. Your testimony is extremely important and, uh, and is going uh, to be included into a report. Um, uh, I want to thank you again, uh, Dr. Gabriel Luel, a postdoctoral fellow at Yale University, and Dr. Ian Spears, associate professor of political science at Guelph. Thanks for being here. Um, we're going to now switch it up with our other witnesses and uh, take a moment's break uh, 
while we do that. Don't go too far away from your chairs, those of you by Zoom. Thank you very much.